as God gives me grace, I would like to share about gate of grace. Perhaps that word, phrase you may not have heard, I also have not heard. We all have heard about the door of grace, but not of gate of grace. Sad to say, in Amer from America, rapidly, the grace is leaving. Therefore, we ought to catch hold of the grace of God. Many of you may know, some time ago, American Bible Society released a Bible, very strange Bible. I had to put it in the dustbin. They removed the word grace out of that, the whole Bible. They call it contemporary English Bible. They removed grace out of the whole Bible. Then what else is remaining there? That shouldn't happen to you and to me. Gate of grace. There are, we read in the Bible about so many gates. In Nehemiah, we read fish gate and valley gate and sheep gate and dung gate and so many gates we read about. And also we read about the gate of salvation, gates of praise, gates of Zion and gates of New Jerusalem. But in one sense, access to all these gates, gate of grace is needed. You may wonder, what is this gate of grace? Again, I tell that is not the door of grace. Gate of grace. It can, otherwise it can be called oh, glory of his grace. In these days, we must really Catch hold of that, that grace, that gate of grace or glory of his grace. Because all other gates or the blessed experiences we can have only once we go through the gate of grace. When I say gate of grace, it doesn't mean it is a literal grace. It literal gate. But as we understand about it, that this wonderful grace, it can really help our spiritual life. I was thinking, as we were singing about the blood-washed saints, how wretched sinners have been washed and saved and raised through the blood of Christ, I had been thinking about my own life. Few minutes, my thoughts went back to my days when I was not saved. And uh, boys with whom I played in the um, ball, soccer, and various other things, and with whom uh, I studied, quite a quite number of them are in a depressed, unhappy, this uh, d disappointed state. And here I am, I'm from, compared to them, I am from a poorer family, with various ways, I have nothing to uh, have any qualifications. But then while we were singing about it, I thought, how wonderfully God changed me, still He is changing me. Beloved ones, what uh, as God puts in my heart to share, you know what the grace of God can do? None of us have still understood it. We have not fathomed it. But as we, whatever way God will give me grace, I would like to share whatever little I know about the gate of grace or the glory of His grace, it is really exciting. Really, it's that grace of God will turn your water into wine. It will turn your bitter into sweet. It will turn your mourning into dancing. It will, it will turn your sighing into singing. It will turn your depression into delight. 
It will turn your discouragement into encouragement. It will turn your shame into glory. It will turn your hatred into love. It will turn, turn your hell into heaven. It will turn your death into life. It will turn your mess into a message. It will turn your darkness into light. I don't know, there can be so many other things you can think about. What? The grace of God, the gate of grace. Particularly, I want to come to that. What is that gate of grace? Because we know, we all know about grace, at least little bit about grace. But what is this gate of grace? Before, late, let, let us come to that. What is the glory of his grace or the gate, gate of grace through which we have access to all other graces, all, all other gates, or all other blessings. As I share with you, as God gives me grace, I would like, I humbly request you, deep in your heart, examine and see whether you and I have that glory of His grace or the gate of grace. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1 from the 6th verse to the praise of the glory of His grace wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved in whom we have redemption through His blood the forgiveness of sins according to the Riches of his grace. Let me stop it now here. To the praise of the glory of his grace. In other words, all eternity, we are going to praise for the glory of his grace. There is some particular glory in that grace. To the praise of the glory of his grace. Grace has a particular glory. Wherein he had abounded, he had made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we are redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. So, the gate of grace is grace to forgive. The gate of grace is forgiving grace. That is the beginning. That is the access. That is the entrance into all other gates, all other graces. Now, there is, a, there is so much, beloved, mentioned. This riches of grace or glory of His grace through the forgiveness, what will it do? Wherein, eight words, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Wherein, in that riches of grace, in that forgiving grace, in that glory of his grace, he has abounded toward us all wisdom and prudence. Solomon was the wisest man in the world. But may I tell you, those who learn to forgive, they are wiser than Solomon. We know, as soon as he went to the throne, what he did, got rid of all his enemies, killed them. Or rather, his father, father's enemies. So, he didn't have all wisdom. But we, wherein he had abounded toward us all wisdom and prudence. Not only that, so when we let, when we have that forgiving grace, we, not only we have all wisdom, we abound in all wisdom and prudence. There is so much there, but let me whatever little I could share with you the important aspects, let me share. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will. 
So if the mystery of the will of God, there are mystery of the will of God that is hidden in the word of God is one thing. And another thing is, about you and me, there is a will, a will of God, which, which will be a mystery till we have this, we go through the gate of grace. In other words, when this forgiving grace comes into our life, then only God can open the gates of glory, gates of to, to reveal what God planned for you and me. Down to earth language, let me say, if you are a person who refuses to forgive, you will never know what is the will of God for your life. You can ask prayer, you may fast, you may ask servants of God. Let me say it again. If you do not have the forgiving grace, you may never know what is the perfect will of God about your life. And a person who does not know the will of God, his life is a wasted life. Having revealed to us the may, having made known unto us the mystery of his will. In other words, if we want to know the deeper things of God, if we want to know what is the purpose of life, your life, first we need have access through the gate of grace. We must learn, we must have the forgiving grace. When you say, I am hurt, I am wounded, I have pain, that means you are a victim of enemy's attack, not a victor. There is a difference between victor and victim. Victim is the one, I am wounded, that person spoke evil of me, I am wounded. That person humiliated me, I am hurt. And that person accused me, I have, I have pain. So you are a victim. Victor means people humiliate you, try to accuse you, speak evil of you, and um, try to um, persecute you. You take it with grace and love them. Then you are a victor. Many people are victims. And they keep on telling a bit, I have pain, I have got wounds, I have got hurts, I have got this thing and that thing. Why do you want to be a victim? Why don't you become a victor over that? Yes, all those things came, but I love that, brother. Oh, I praise God. I have no hurt. How many you, from the depths of your heart, how many of you can say that you don't have any hurt feeling in your heart? You don't have any wounds in your heart. A wounded man is a liability for God, not an asset. We read in the Bible about a king, I am wounded. Take me out of the battlefield. Even now in the world too, in a battle, if a soldier is wounded, immediately people, they will, volunteers will come and take out of the battlefield. A wounded man cannot fight the battles. Battles of the Lord. Why don't you, why do you want to remain a victim? Always, oh, I'm, I'm a victim of this and they victimized me and this and that. No. Do you know, although in English language there is a word called character assassination, that is wrong. Nobody can assassinate your character except yourself. Nobody can kill your character. You can kill your character. And you are doing it by keeping the hurt feeling. When you are hurt and wounded and you got pain, you are killing yourself. It is a moral suicide. You are trying to kill yourself. But the grace of God, not only it will heal the wounds and hurts, grace of God will be such an spiritual insulation. You don't feel hurt at all. You don't feel wounded at all. We read about Daniel, 
he was thrown into the den of lions, but he told the king, because innocence is found before you, and I have not done any harm, these lions couldn't hurt me. Yes, this world may be a den of lions, beloved ones. But if the innocence is found in us, and if we have not harmed anyone, nobody can hurt. You only can hurt yourself. Nobody else can hurt. This evening while I was coming, uh, driving and coming here, I saw a, some, I don't know, it's a business board or a co maybe company, insurance company board, I think. And nobody can ruin your day except yourself. Have you seen that board somewhere there? That is very true. You are ru you ruining your day. Although it may be a company insurance policy attraction thing, spiritually it is very true. You only can ruin your day. You get upset, angry, and you, you feel um, irritated, and you feel hated. You are ruining your day. Why do you want to do that? This forgiving grace is not that you, um, somebody is doing something against you and you struggle to forgive that person and then finally you forgive. No. Forgiving grace or gate of grace is that when that person will accuse you, humiliate you, try to trouble you and try to disturb you, you don't feel that way. You only feel compassion for that person. You feel that person doesn't know Christ. And you wanted to give more of Christ's love to him. So, forgiving grace has so many other graces along with that. I don't think I will be sharing all those things. I don't know all of them either. But I want to focus this on these beloved ones. Yes, you have heard so many times about forgiveness. And very often I find that when, whenever I preach, I end up about preaching about forgiveness. Because this is where so many, now that I am for some time in India, almost every day there are deaths taking place. And there are times before dying, I, not always, but sometimes I go and see people. I ask this question, do you have anything against anybody? You know most of the people what they say? They have. And against to whom? Can you guess? Against own family people. Not against somebody strangers. Quite often I found when I ask that before dying people, they have against their own family members hurt feelings. Now, while listening to the word of God, you just see that is scriptural too. The first man in the Bible who became bitter and had hatred and killed, it was not a stranger or enemy, Cain killed his own blood brother. So, how strange it is, the same from generations that is going, that is continuing. Cain had bitterness against old blood brother. And now generations have gone by. Still look at the people, perhaps some of you seated here, examine your heart. Quite a number of people have against own family, maybe husband, maybe wife. They may be existing under one roof. But there are some, they don't show outwardly, but there are times just comes up and through irritations and you want to hurt that person. The way you speak, you deliberately want to hurt that person. But when you are hurting somebody, beloved ones, what you are doing, you are hurting deeply. Like the honeybee, when the honeybee stings, what happens with that impact of that sting, it falls down and dies. It may be giving little pain for you, 
But the honeybee gets more pain. The one who hurts gets more pain and it falls down and dies. So when you are hurting, you may delight in hurting others. I know I am guilty of doing that. But then you find a, a deeper hurt is coming there. But beloved ones, we read in the word of God, come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace in time of need. There is something exciting in the Old Testament. It's a type of the throne of grace. That was Solomon's throne. Solomon's throne was a type of the throne of grace that we find in this the New Testament. Kindly turn with me to, that is something very enlightening and encouraging to see. Solomon made a throne. First Kings chapter 10, and we read about uh, some uh, graphic picture we find here. Chapter 10, verse 18 to 20, the Solomon's throne, which he made, can be compared to the throne of grace. And moreover, the king made a great throne of ivory and overlaid it with the best gold. The throne had six steps and the top of the throne was round behind and there were stays on either side on the place of the seat and two lions stood beside the stays and the tall lions stood there on the one side and on the other upon the six steps. There was not the like made in any kingdom. Nowhere else we can find a throne like the throne of grace. What we find here, the king made a great throne. That king is the king of kings, our Lord Jesus Christ. And it was the throne of ivory. You know, ivory is white, pure white, but harder than rock. That ivory stands for solid purity. Solid purity means one day you live a holy life and tomorrow you mess up. And then another day again you try to struggle to live a holy life. No. It is like ivory. Ivory is harder than rock. A solid, stable, holy life. And it was covered, overlaid with the best gold. Mind you, in the whole Bible, only in this place is mentioned the best gold. Although in other places, gold of Ophir and other gold is mentioned, but this is the only place we read the best gold. What is that best gold? We know. Gold has so many meanings, but here it stands for grace. What is the best gold? How can there be best grace? There is nothing in the Bible called best grace. But we read grace upon grace, shouting grace, grace, that headstone laid the best gold. Grace upon grace. As I mentioned that this is a type of the throne of grace. And what we find, there are six steps on either side. A lion was standing. In every step, two lions on either side. We know from the Bible, the lions, the lion has two, Bible says, two outstanding characteristics. Righteous are bold like lion. That we read in Proverbs 28, 1. Then we read Proverbs 30, 30. That lion, the strongest among beasts, which turneth not away for any. So lion has two particular characteristics Bible speaks about. Boldness and strength. So beloved ones, 
throne of Solomon is a type of the throne of grace. What the grace of God can do in your life, you may be a very timid person. You may be full of fear. You may be a person with lot of uh, um, fearful, panicking character. But I am blessed to see what God did in the life of Timothy. You know in the Bible, of course, unless we very carefully read, we may not realize Timothy was a very timid young man. He was afraid to use God-given gifts. Perhaps he had the gift of um, prophecy or healing gifts or some other gifts. Repeatedly Paul had to tell him, you stir up the gifts. God has not given the um, spirit of fear. First of all, maybe somebody can read that verse. See, First Timothy chapter 4 verse 14. He was full of fear. He was afraid to use God-given gifts. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. So here, because he was so timid, Paul was encouraging him, use the gift. And again, again he had to tell the same thing. Read Second Timothy chapter 1 verse 6 and 7. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. She repeatedly says, Timothy again, use the stir up the gifts that God has given. And I laid the hands and prayed for you, the gift you receive, use it. God has not given you the spirit of fear. He has such a fear. And he, you know, he was afraid to go to Corinthian church. And therefore, he had to write a letter to the, Corinth, to the church in Corinthian. I am sending Timothy. He is a fearful boy. Please make sure that he will be free. Read that first Corinthians chapter six, uh, 16 verse 10. From this, we see how fearful he was. Now, if Timotheus comes, see that he may be with you without fear. Ah, so, he's telling the Corinthian judge that I'm sending Timothy, please make sure that he will be free from fear. Such a person. We read in Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, he says, be strong in the grace. He was telling, be strong in the grace. Finally, what happened to Timothy? Such a timid boy who was afraid even to go to the Corinthian church. Of course, Corinthian church was a notorious church. And this, such a young man who was afraid to use his gifts. Finally, you know, he became so bold. He was willing to go to prison for Jesus. Read about that. Hebrews chapter 13. Was 23. Not only he went to prison, he came out in flying colors. Three. Know we that our brother Timothy is set at liberty. Praise God. See, he was in prison and he came out in flying colors and he continued to serve the Lord. Beloved ones, this Solomon's throne is a type of the throne of grace. These two lions on every step. Boldness and strength. You, today you may be a very timid person. You may be afraid to serve God. Lord, I cannot give a testimony. I cannot stand up. I may shiva. And there may be little things. I, some of you may be like Timothy. I have the gift of prophecy or some other gifts I am afraid to use. But look at the grace that worked in the life of Timothy. How, for the sake of Jesus, he was able to go to the prison and continued in the prison and he was able to come out being a testimony. And what we further find about this throne, this great throne of ivory, and overlaid with the best gold, the best of God's grace, or grace upon grace. 
Our holy life is only grace of God. Sometimes we may think because we go to church or fast and pray and read the Bible and so many things. No, beloved ones, all these things are necessary. He made a throne of ivory and overlaid it with the best gold. When the grace of God, the sovereign grace, then comes into our life, holiness becomes a highway. It's not a narrow way. A highway there will be there, will be there and a way. It shall be called way of holiness. Holiness is not a narrow way. Although in one sense it is called a narrow way. But when the grace of God, when the best gold covering the throne, then you find it's ivory. Ivory you can hardly break it. Ivory hardly you can, uh, you throw it down or do anything. Ivory is so solid. So holy life, we must be zealous for holiness. How do we get holiness? The grace of God. But then what should we do? Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. We read in Genesis 6, 8, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. If that is so, where did he look? He didn't look anywhere else. The imaginations and the thoughts of the people continually were evil in those days. But Noah didn't look at that place. Noah's eyes were just in the face of God. In the eyes of God. What does that means that Noah found grace in the eyes of God. What does it mean that Noah looked at the face of God? Beloved ones, that is what we are trying to teach our people. Look to God for your needs. Look to God for your healing. Look to God for your sustenance. Look to God for your spiritual growth. Look to God for your material needs. Look to God for everything. Why we don't take collection here? If we take collection, so much of so many so much of money will come in. In a very clever way, we can also make some announcements and all. So we are not taking collections, not because we do we we have all our needs met. No, we are taught. To look at the face of God. If we look at the face of God, what will come from there? Not money. Grace will come. And that is needed. We live by the grace of God. We serve by the grace of God. If you serve God for money, one day money will be gone and you will be gone. Noah found grace in the eyes of God. That is why we don't borrow. That is why we teach our believers not to borrow. By the way, what for the information I got, although America is called a rich country, Americans are borrowing more than anybody else. Can you believe that? Whether to buy a house, to buy a car or anything, they borrow. And they have more credit cards than anybody else. If I am wrong, please forgive me. <laughs> yeah, there may be times for the, some business uh, re, um, in a, uh, re, uh, transactions and all. Sometimes a credit card may be needed here. What I wanted to say, no one found grace in the eyes of God. Do you want grace? Look to the eyes of God for your needs. When you are sick, look to God. Doctors and medicine perhaps may heal you, but they cannot give you grace of God. Noah found grace in the eyes of God. That's why we teach the church here. Why we look to God for he Why should you look to God for healing? The grace of God may come upon you. Why you should in borrow? Why we teach our people to live within the means? While there is so much of opportunity to borrow and buy things of luxury, you may do that. 
But may I tell you from the word of God, if you don't look to the face of God, you don't find grace. You will find money and borrow and so much of um, um, interest you may pay. In the end, what you find, you are losing out the grace of God. The more you look to God for your needs, your provisions, the more grace will come in your life. You And that is why we read in 22nd chapter, um, Revelation, the other day in the um, seminar, I was so blessed by when a servant of God said, his servant shall see his face, they will serve him. So if we have to see his face in eternity, now we must look to his face so that the grace of God will come. And that grace will be, as we read, my grace is sufficient for thee. In other words, there is sufficient grace for us. I humbly request you, beloved ones, if you just to make a decision trusting in the mercy of God, Lord, hereafter, when I become sick, I want to look to your face. It doesn't say the healing will come immediately. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. One day it may be true that you may not get healed, you may die. But you can die in grace. There is a grace in the Bible called dying grace. Maybe a little later I can come to that. Sickness will be there. But you may, when you don't look to God, you don't get grace. So we need a dying grace. Every day, grace is like a manna. Every day we need manna, grace of God. And we can double manna. So, as we love and serve God and we need double grace for the weekend. And there is an eternal manna that was in the most holy place. That manna never bred worms. Never stag. So there is an eternal grace. Now I may have grace to preach, you may have grace to preach and sing and testify and use your talents. That is for temporary grace. That grace when we die, that grace also will die. But there is a manna that is in the most holy place, that is kept in the golden pot. In the holy of holies. That is eternal manna. There is an eternal grace. That can only come when we look to God. We are not exalting our church beloved ones. But one thing we try to teach. Our people should learn to trust God for their money. Trust God for their healing. Trust God for their day to day needs. Trust God for the spiritual needs. The grace of God can do that. And what we read about further about this throne, which is a type of throne of grace, we find that, uh, and uh, 19 was the throne had six steps and the top of the throne was around behind. The top of the throne behind was round. That shows global, universal grace. As you know, this globe, this world is round. So, this throne of grace, what, that, what is universal grace means? You may be living in a corner in the earth, on this earth, unknown to the people in the world. But if we live full of grace, and that grace will become a blessing. You will be a blessing to the whole world. Perhaps now you may not know that. By the way, your usefulness, if you are living by the grace of God, your usefulness does not stop with death. Perhaps till you die, you may not be found as as really useful. It is eternity that is going to reveal the usefulness. Today in the world, we 
why we don't go to the television ministry and radio ministry? Not because we don't have money. God gives us all our needs. So much. But there is a hidden ministry that many people may not know that, understand. If today St. Paul had been living, can you tell any television people will uh, accept him and ask him to come and give a telecast? This small, short man. And Bible itself says his speech is contemptible and rude. No doubt Eutychus fell down and he died. Because when I preach, some people sleep, but nobody died so far, thank God, while sleeping. <laughs> but he was, his speech was contemptible and it was just rude. And Corinthian people told, we don't want you. You always is in and out of prison. People were stoning him and what a way. I don't think, and such a small man in a bread basket, he could be taken and throw into the other side of the wall. And do you think today Moses will be accepted in the television? He is stammering man. Get out. <laughs> that is, there is something hidden ministry God has given us. And I tell you, you are privileged to know these blessed truths, beloved ones. What I want to say, we must be zealous for the truth. Stand for the truth. Willing to live for the truth and die for the truth. We do not want to attract people with weight. There are hardly there is anybody with a PhD and DD in our ministry. So many people are there. And in India, there are so many uneducated servants of God. Well used. Some of them are pastors holding great responsibility. Grace of God is like flood in the days of Noah. What happened? Flood covered the mountains, covered all the, all the boundary walls and all the fences. Finally, all could be seen was flood of waters, flood of waters. Beloved ones, God wants to bring you and me to that flood level. That all could be seen, nothing. Only the grace of God. Only the grace of God. Only the grace of God. But again, I, let me emphasize that. We must have this forgiving grace. Because that is the beginning. All other graces, exceeding riches of grace. And we read about God is able to make all grace abound toward us. That we always having all sufficiency in all things may abound unto every good work. It's amazing, beloved ones. But what thing saddening my heart, in spite of knowing all these blessed truths, many of us have not learned to forgive. When I say, we may say that I forgive, but when time comes, irritation comes, that person did this, that person did that. That really ruins everything in our life. Forgiveness is a grace. You receive grace too. Naturally you cannot forgive. When you think about the person, what they have, that person has done, and the way that person behaved, how ungrateful to you, you cannot forgive. Forgiveness is a grace. And grace is forgiveness. They both go together. There was, there's a couple still there alive, I, I believe. And wife is a deeply committed Christian. Husband was unsaved. A terrible womanizer. And he will come home after work and will eat the dinner and straight away he will go to visit his girlfriend and may not come back from there perhaps he may go to work and evening again will come back and will have the dinner and then go away 
One day she went to the pastor and told, Pastor, I cannot take it anymore. This is what he is doing. I, I cook the meal for him and then he comes and eats and then straight away goes to see his girlfriend and number of times he doesn't return at night. From there he goes to work. I cannot take it anymore. And the pastor prayed and gave an advice. Do one thing. After all, only a few hours he is staying in the house. When he comes, he takes the dinner and then goes away. Whenever he comes, you take Jesus has come home. And if Jesus will come home, what will you do for him? You will do the best, isn't it? You do the best for Jesus. Will you do the best for Jesus? Yes. But this man is swearing and cursing and shouting and, and on the time he comes in, all what he will be doing, only cursing and shouting and creating problem, doesn't matter, Pastor told him. You take as Jesus has come home. Hereafter, give the best meal for him. And when he shouts, don't shout back. Don't speak anything to irritate him. She agreed, but it was hard for her. But because she respected the pastor and knew that it was God's counsel, she prayed, Lord, all this time I have been shouting back. I have been talking back. I get irritated. Lord, give me the grace, as pastor told me. Lord, humanly it is impossible. From the time he comes, he will be shouting, and even about the food, he will be murmuring and complaining about so many things, Lord. Give me the grace, Lord, as pastor told me, that I may take that Jesus has come home. And as she cried to God, God gave the grace. And next day, as usual, shouting, murmuring and complaining and cursing, husband came quietly and the best possible food that she could make and she laid there and he kept on saying this and that and you are late and this is that. She just kept quiet. The man was a bit surprised. What happened to my wife today? And as usual, he went to see his girlfriend. Few days went by. It, it was like a stabbing into his heart. It pierced his heart. This is Christianity. My wife knows how I am unfaithful to her. See the way she loves me and cares for me. If this is so, if Christ could do that for her, such a change, that Christ could change me too. To cut short the story, he became a beautiful Christian. The grace of God changed her. Do you want your wife to be changed? No. Don't pray for that. Don't pray for your husband to be changed. You need to be changed. I need to be changed. Do you want your children to be changed? No, no, no. Children are all right. But you need the grace. There is that transforming grace. The grace that changes. If that changes. Uh, one day in a youth camp, one young boy, he was sad, he was getting irritated. And he was he didn't want to participate in any of in any of the activity activities. He was keeping himself aloof. I went and asked him, "Son, why are you behaving like that? Why don't you join and at least go and play with the other children? And why do you sit in the corner?" I first he didn't say anything. He didn't want to tell. Again, I pleaded with him. You know what the boy told? 
My parents are hypocrites. That's all he told me. Now, at the moment, parents are out of the church. And all the children are out of the church. Dear ones, it is true in one sense, you think that there should be a change in your children, change in your husband, change in your wife, and change for this and that. But there is a, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. When the grace of God will come, your daughter-in-law will not be daughter-in-law. She will become more than your own daughter. Your son-in-law will not be a son-in-law. He will become more than your son. When there will be a problem between your son and the daughter-in-law, whose side you will take, you know, if you have grace? You will take the side of the daughter-in-law. And then the son will stop fighting. But when you take the side of the son, he will fight more because my mother is supporting me, my father is supporting me. But when they both are standing by the daughter-in-law, he loses ground. He doesn't get any chance. But mostly what? They, what, what the parents do? They always take the side of the son and fight against the daughter-in-law and the devil will be dancing in the house. And next to what you can see is divorce and still then you will be saying, my son is right. Your son is dead right. <laughs> if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things are passed away. People are fed up hearing sermons and after sermons and sermons. There are so many sermon mongers. They say, show us the life. We want to see the life. In him was the life. And the life was the light of men. Beloved ones, I failed to be a servant of God to show light to you. I apologize to you for that. Pray that the grace of God will change me. I am not standing to preach to you. First I am preaching to myself. I need the grace of God. Anybody can go to the Bible college and learn some Hebrew and Greek and preach a beautiful, far better sermon than I can do or any one of us can do. But grace is that is changing our character. There are two different types of grace. One is the grace that we can minister to others, minister healings and deliverance. Thank God for that grace. That also is needed. But there is another grace for every one of us. That is a changing grace. Our character to be changed. That grace can work first by getting or coming to the gate of grace. And afterwards, it's very easy. So many people say Christian life is very hard. Don't believe it. Bible says, my Bible says, joy unspeakable and full of glory. If foretaste of heaven is like that, joy unspeakable and full of glory, what will be the real glory? What will be the real when the, the joy of all heaven, when we see him, it will be real joy. And as I Come back to the word of God. As I mentioned, there is a dying grace. Or in other words, when we grow in the grace of... Uh, word of God says, grow in the grace. So, as we grow in the grace of God, the last moment of our life, there is a grace. Grace to die. Or the, la the grace, the last moments we will have. So many people, of course none of us are dead. But so many of us have a fear. Death is frightening. Death is painful. Death is tormenting. 
if my Bible is true, that's absolutely wrong. For a saint, death is sweet. And that is what the Bible says. He giveth his beloved sleep. When thou shalt lie down, thou shalt not be afraid, thou shalt lie down and thy sleep shall be sweet. We will turn to the grace that we receive or saints receive at the time of death. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9 But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. Taste death by grace. When we read the Gospels about the death of Jesus, it will appear he was bleeding and crying, everybody had forsaken him, he was so thirsty, nobody gave him water, and he was humiliated and rejected, and he was calling, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It looks very pathetic death. It looks a horrible death in one sense, that is true also. But here you find the real death of Jesus by grace, by the grace of God tasting death. Jesus tasted death. That word tasting is like tasting like honey, not something bitter. Tasted death by the grace of God. So, if we look to the face of God now, and grace, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, same man at Lord, beloved ones, when we keep growing in the grace, how do we grow in the grace? Keep more looking at Jesus. Keep more looking at him for our needs, for our provisions, for our day-to-day -day strength, for our wisdom, for guidance, for leading, for counsel. For oh, everything, we keep looking to Jesus. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And then we will keep growing in the grace of God. Again, I tell you, don't forget the fact that forgiving grace is the beginning. That is the entrance. And then only all other grace come. Forgiving grace means you don't feel hurt at all. You don't feel offended. You never speak against your enemy bad things. Only you speak good things about them. One day I, I believe on the day of judgment, you and I stand before God. God will ask a question. How much good things you have done to your enemies? What will you say that time? How much good things you have done, not for your friends. How, many, how much good things you have done to your enemies? Will you say, all I have done was evil only? But did you not know that I told her in the Bible, I read, love your enemies, good, do good to them that hate you. If your enemy is hungry, feed them. Have you done that? Physically and spiritually? Perhaps God may ask another question. How many good things you have spoken about your enemies? Some of us may be freezing that judgment day. Oh, I only spoke evil about my enemies. You look at Second Samuel, how, although in one sense David had so many drawbacks, but about Saul, how many good things he is speaking about King Saul. Beloved ones, grace of God can change us. How long we have been believers and workers, <clears throat> that is not at all taken into account before God. How much of change happened in our character? 
that is what in, in the final analysis going to be taken into account and therefore that uh, we need this gate of grace or glory of his grace how do you know still in your heart there is something to forgive one thing there are so many signs one thing from the bible we read if you are not really forgiven others you cannot concentrate when you read the bible your mind will go somewhere else when you pray your mind will go somewhere else and not only for reading a bible or praying generally you will lose concentration i will take the bible verse a little later what will happen if you continue to keep some bitterness and revenge against somebody you will you want to eat food but you think about that person he let me down he deceived me he humiliated me so your food is becoming poison that bitterness and so you cannot enjoy the food because that person is coming to your mind and whenever you have conversation you want to bring that person into the conversation he did that 10 years ago 20 years ago so your conversation is being controlled by that person you want to sleep and that person comes into your mind he did that i should take revenge i should teach him a lesson and i should do this when you want to sleep either your sleep is delayed or disturbed because that person is controlling and as the days go by you find somebody is controlling you you lost control of yourself that enemy against whom you have bitterness and anger and revenge that person is controlling you you become an emotional wreck you lose control how do you know from the bible that when you don't forgive somebody that you cannot concentrate properly read philippians and chapter 3 read 13 and 14 sorry chapter uh, that's right chapter 3 13 and 14 brother and i count not myself to have apprehended but this one thing i do forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before i press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of god in christ jesus see press toward the mark shows your mind your concentration is on that mark we know that mark is christ i press toward the mark to concentrate on that particular thing god wants us to concentrate what should we do forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before forgetting things behind means there are hurt feelings there are feelings of pain feelings of wound feeling of how rejections forgetting forgetting doesn't mean literally forgetting literally we cannot forget somebody somebody something this morning somebody has done how can i forget this evening or even after 20 years forgetting means that thought of that erasing all the ill feelings irritations hurt feelings and the pain and the wound erasing that is called forgetting those things yes you may remember that what yesterday what that person has done against you but you don't have any ill feeling you don't have any irritation against that person all what you feel is only compassion for that person so that we read about as um we read that uh, hebrews chapter 2 let us come back again uh, to that that should uh, by the grace of god should taste death so 
for a saint who is growing in the grace of God, there is a final grace. The, the, the grace at the end. Or oh, while dying there is a grace we receive. That grace we may not receive any time before. And that word is like tasting death like honey. Honey tasting. For saints, saints do not die. It's only sinners die. Saints sleep. It is sweet sleep. Here, by the grace of God should taste death. If you cannot forgive now, every unforgiving spirit at the time of our death will be like a sting. Oh death, where is thy sting? Oh grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. So, not only unforgiving spirit, every hidden sin, unconfessed sin, will be at the time of at the end of our life will be like a sting. That will be stinging our soul, spirit and body. So many dear children of God, they wait till the time of death to confess their hidden sins. No, beloved ones, very often dying confessions are very shallow. It's not deep at all. Don't wait for death. Or wait. Perhaps it can be yours may be a sudden death, mine may be a sudden death. We may not have time to confess anything. But now the standard is really going down, particularly among Pentecostal people. You can watch anything, isn't it? Because in the internet you can find all the latest Hollywood or movies or anything. But a day of judgment will be there. I remember in, um, in Sri Lanka, one of our believers' sons, he was only about 10, 10 or 9 year old boy, was walking through the street, there was a cinema theater. There were some attractive posters were there. He looked at them and enjoyed looking at them and walked past. Somebody saw that and reported to the faith all. And the boy was disciplined for looking at those people. Now what is happening to the Pentecostal people? Your sin will find you out. Standard of holiness according to the country, according to the language, according to the culture. You cannot twist and change. Stand for holiness. Be a man of holiness. If you don't love holiness, you don't have a backbone. You are a vegetable in the sight of God. I tell you, the grace of God can bring it. God has got plenty of grace to give. God is not stingy like you and I. He has plenty to give. He liberally gives. Abundantly gives. He giveth grace to the humble. There is a dying grace. Actually, for a saint, the last moment of his life, her life is the most blessed moment. That is the moment he will be seeing the face of Jesus. The real face of Jesus. And that will be the moment he will be really experiencing, not the foretaste, the full taste of heaven. That will be the moment experiencing the glory receiving in the body, changing this body into glorious. This wild body will be changed and we shall be fashioned into this glorious body. Beloved ones, if you really walk with God, if you have not kept any unconfessed sins, don't be afraid of death. Death will be. If life with Jesus is sweet, death with Jesus will be sweeter. And eternity in heaven with Jesus will be 
sweetest. Let me close my words. Solomon's throne, only Solomon alone could sit. Although there are so many things we learned about. But the throne of grace come boldly to sit on the throne. Throne is so many. Normally throne is a type of a ruling or reigning. Also, it is a place of rest. People in the world, those who rule and reign, they don't have any rest. They are so restless. Most of the, I understand, a good number of people in America, the chemist, in the chemist shops, two things are in much um, sale. Sleeping tablets and blood pressure tablets. People, if they want to go to sleep, they need sleeping tablets. And when they awake, to keep not really level-headed, maybe semi-level-headed, they need blood pressure tablets. Why do we need all these things, dear ones? Come boldly to the great throne of grace. Tell the Lord, if you have a problem to forgive, frankly tell the Lord, Lord, I have a problem. That person may be dead and gone. Maybe that person very close to your family. Maybe your own wife, your own husband. Lord, I have a problem. I'm not able to forgive. Help me to forgive, forgive and love her. Let me see Jesus in that place, person. If we have to see Jesus in that person, first Jesus has to come in our person. And I want to tell you, all the way we can experience the grace of God. And the dying moment will be, will not be a time of pain. Only the sting. Um, some of you from India know Pastor Philip, who died two weeks ago. I went, I was there for the funeral. It was like a big convention. Um, uh, Trouble the size of the people who were there for the funeral. Perhaps 10,000 people, at least, for that. And he, it was such a sweet sleep. Just about one hour, he had some uneasiness. Even I was, I, I was privileged to pray on the phone for him. Uh, I was in Madras, he was in Kerala. And after the prayer, he, he was in the chair. He told, I want to lie down. He himself raised the legs and put on the bed. And he's, including the closing the eyes, he himself did. Nobody had to do anything. And nobody could think he was dying because it was such a sweet way he was slipping to the presence of God. Don't be afraid of death, but afraid of life. The way you live, the way I live. Some of you, in the spirit I tell you, you are keeping some secret sins in your life. Immoral. Bible says the immoral people go to the hottest place in hell. The deepest place in hell. It's time for me to close my words. After starting with grace, I don't want to end up in the horrible sin, but just saying grace, grace and sin cannot finish it. We must be careful about sin. Grace of God cannot cover sin unless we repent, confess, admit and renounce it. Today, don't go away from the presence of God hiding sin. It may be 30 years ago you did something, you touched somebody. But you have been hiding cleverly, your sin will find you out. Grace of God can only cover sin which is confessed and repented and renounced. Then grace of God will become. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Come boldly to the throne of grace. Solomon's throne that two side, either side, there are two lions. Righteous are bold like lion. Lions are strongest among beasts. Turneth not away for any. You may be afraid of death. You may be timid. Grace of God can make you lion and bless you. As may I request the singers to come and sing. Before as they come to sing, shall we stand? For a word of prayer. Gracious Lord, we come to the throne of grace 
first I come, O oh God, to the throne of grace. How many times I was wounded and hurt, offended. O oh God, how many times I couldn't love others. O oh God, how many times I spoke spoken evil of others. Forgive me, Lord. I don't want to leave this pulpit as a hypocrite, O oh God. Forgive me, O oh God. And as the congregation, we come to you, O oh God. We let you down. Lord, there are times we couldn't love our own family members, brethren. Forgive us, O oh God. Let the great, Lord, let everyone enter through the gate of grace. The glory of your grace, O oh God. So that finally we can go through the gate of glory to meet the glorious Lord. Thank you for helping us in Jesus' name. Tender love, come be healed. I don't know what your sickness may be or what mine may be, but the Lord is saying, come, I forgive you. What is your sin? Maybe you're ashamed. Maybe you told no one. God knows all about it. Forgive. And you'll be forgiven. In fact, you are forgiven. <laughs> God's love. Oh, my. God loves you, dear child. And he's forgiven you. He has pardoned you. Maybe you've been trying for years to get saved. You are saved. Jesus saved you. <laughs> Maybe you've been waiting for healing. You are healed. By his stripes, what does it say? You will be healed? No. By his stripes you are, you are healed. So, Father God, we thank you tonight that this great work was done. And Jesus said there, hanging on the cross, it is finished. <laughs> it is finished. And since then, that river of grace has been flowing all over the world. <coughs> Multitudes, multitudes have come. They've been healed, they've been saved, Lord, and they have found joy and peace. Lord, and the kingdom of God is increasing. Oh, God, and tonight is increasing also. The multitudes coming. Come, my brother, come, my sister. You just come and kneel at the foot of the cross. You're going to be saved, healed, blessed, happy, joyous, peaceful. And you'll start forgiving your enemies, yes, your worst enemies, until you're filled with the joy of God's heaven. You come. You come and give your heart to Jesus. And we'll thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. This is all your work of grace. We give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Just as I am. Praise the Lord. Amen. You come. You come. And just we'll make room here in the front. Give your heart, body, soul, mind, spirit. <laughs> give it all to him. <laughs> He's right here with that nail-pierced hand outstretched to lay upon you. God bless you.